Good evening, everybody. We're going to let you have a little bit of a chance to, to get in here to the seminar before I start our introductions, but uh, we sure welcome all of you and glad that you're coming back for this this evening. It's our first of our One Health seminars for the fall semester, uh, and we're starting it off with a big bang here, I think, with Dr. Khan. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So for those of you who are attending tonight, probably many of you, this is the first time that you've attended a One Health seminar here at Del Val. I want to tell you a little bit about how One Health and, and our view of this particular concept. So One Health is a transdisciplinary systems approach. Basically, what it understands is that people, uh, animals, plants, the environment, are all within one system, Earth, you know, and that uh, we really have to keep it in mind that what happens to us or what we do has impacts on others, whether it's on other people, whether it's on the environment, whether it's on animals and vice versa. Uh, and certainly when we look at disease ecology, we can see this quite readily that we've got zoonoses that spread uh, to humans and that we in turn can pass them back to animals as well. So at DelVal, we've been working on this. This is actually our sixth year of uh, One Health seminars. We offer six seminars each semester. Uh, and our, our approach to One Health itself, let me just change my slide here. Oh, there we go. Uh, is kind of three pronged. And so there's education. And so each one of our freshmen, at least, are uh, through DelVal II experience uh, being introduced to the concept of One Health. Um, research, we're really hoping that we can tear down what silos there may exist and for people from different disciplines to work together on problems, whether these are problems here on campus, whether they're local problems, regional problems, or whether they're global problems, uh, that we recognize that all of these require transdisciplinary approaches, recognizing the value of other disciplines and combining those in trying to deal with the, the issues that we're faced with. And then finally, outreach. And certainly that's what the One Health seminars are all about. Uh, the intent here is to provide a forum for us to demonstrate uh, the depth and breadth of the One Health concept itself uh, and also to have an opportunity for us to hear from people around the world uh, who are really making a difference in their particular fields and who recognize the One Health concept or at least the transdisciplinary needs. Our belief is if our students leave DelVal with this appreciation of transdisciplinary approaches, this is gonna be a big boom for our society. It'll make them better global citizens, uh, and I believe that it will actually improve their careers as they go ahead. Uh, for somebody of my age, it took me years to really come to this. Hopefully you'll come to it a lot quicker. Uh, for our community members that are with us tonight, thank you so much for joining us. And we're gonna jump into our introduction. Uh, for those of you who uh, have seen my past presentations or past One Health seminars, Generally, I don't go into a formal introduction, but I'm going to change that tonight. Uh, Dr. Laura Kahn has got an incredible resume, and even from the description on the flyer, I just want to go ahead and read that again, uh, because we are very lucky to have her with us tonight. So Dr. Laura Kahn is a physician, policy researcher, educator, and author. In 2006, she published Confronting Zoonoses, linking human and veterinary medicine in the CDC journal, uh, Emerging Infectious Diseases, which helped launch the One Health Initiative. Uh, she is the author of two books, including Who's in Charge? Leadership During Epidemics, Bioterror Attacks and Other Public Health Crises, and One Health and the Polit Politics of Antimicrobial Resistance. In 2020, she uh, launched an online course, Bats, Ducks, and pandemics, an introduction to One Health policy. 
She has over 5,500 students enrolled in that free online course, and I'm one of them. Uh, <laughs> she's received in 2014 the Presidential Award for Meritorious Physician uh, for Service for the American from the American Association of Public Health Physicians, and in 2016, the American Veterinary Epidemiological Society awarded her with her highest honor for her work in One Health. Who better to kick off our One Health semester but Dr. Laura Kahn? Welcome, and thank you for joining us, Laura. Reg, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. It's truly an honor for me to, uh, to speak with all of you. Uh, can you all see my screen? Is it? Yes. Uh, okay, terrific. So um, in this uh, seminar that I'm gonna give, uh, I'm going to talk about tying together uh, food safety and security, antimicrobial resistance, and climate change. And yes, they are all connected, and uh, I will uh, show you how they are. Um, so uh, agriculture is the foundation of civilization, and climate change threatens agriculture and food security. And antimicrobials are the foundation of modern medicine. Uh, many of the therapies that we take for granted, whether it's elective surgery or cancer chemotherapy, simply become too risky to do uh, if we don't have effective antibiotics. So antimicrobial resistance then threatens antimicrobial use and food safety. So together, um, they, if we wanna have a modern functioning society, we need to have both agriculture and we need to have antimicrobials. So just a few definitions. Um, food security means no hunger. Food safety means no foodborne illness. And AMR means antimicrobial resistance. And with that, I'm focusing on bacteria, not viruses or fungi. So I'm speaking about antibiotics. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with antimicrobial resistance, um, normally uh, bacteria, if you expose them to antibiotics, they die. Uh, but resistant bacteria, if you expose them to antibiotics, they don't, uh, they don't die. Uh, and so you've got a problem if you have an infection. So as Reg mentioned, um, the One Health concept, um, I approach it uh, very simply that human, animal, plant, environmental, and ecosystem health are linked. And then this concept then provides a very useful, simple, comprehensive framework for examining complex issues. And if we want to address these complex issues, we have to look at the root causes if we want to develop effective policies. And I think it's important that people recognize that we interact with our environment every day by inhaling air, drinking water, and eating and drinking the plants, uh, drinking water and eating the plants and animals that we call food. Um, this is the One Health Initiative website, so uh, please visit it. It is a uh, labor of love for all of us uh, and tell all your friends and colleagues to visit it too. So when I talk about a framework, I think I personally use a, a matrix, a cube, multidimensional cube, looking at one health factors, humans and animals, plants, environments, and ecosystems in one dimension. In another dimension, looking at it from complexity factors, microbial, individual, and population, and then the third dimension is the political, social, and economic factors, and those can be represented by political borders, whether it's local, regional, national, or international and global. And uh, so this is the three-dimensional perspective of it. Um, this is a two-dimensional uh, perspective of it. And so you can see that you get these uh, nice little boxes that you can fill in um, for the relevant uh, issues that you want to cover. For the purposes of my talk, I'm defining environments as the abiotic or the soil, water, and air aspects of defined geographic areas, 
and ecosystems are the biotic, the microbial flora and fauna within defined geographic areas. And so in this talk then, we're going to do a One Health analysis using these different One Health factors, um, focusing primarily on microbial and populations looking at fecal microbes. Uh, and we're going to do it uh, at the international level. So in other words, I'm going to give you a One Health satellite perspective of uh, these issues um, that we're dealing with. So first off, let's look at humans and animals at the uh, international global level, looking at microbes and populations. Um, there are now almost 8 billion humans and we have over 30 billion terrestrial food animals. Together, humans and their domesticated food animals make up about 96 to 98% of the global terrestrial mammalian biomass. So there's just not that much wildlife left. This was back in 2000. And our livestock is not a diverse, uh, diverse uh, species. So they're actually, uh, the diversity is in the wildlife. So if we want to preserve biodiversity, it has to be in the wildlife. It's not going to be in the livestock. We have more broiler chickens on the planet than any other bird with a standing population of almost 23 billion. And people are eating more and more chickens all the time. Uh, and with all of these uh, humans, 8 billion humans and over 30 billion food animals, as well as the famous children's book author, Taro Gomi states, everyone, all animals eat, so everyone poops. Uh, and that is uh, a profound statement. Uh, and indeed, we produce around 4 trillion kilograms each year. That's the uh, humans and their domesticated animals, as was estimated by David Berendis and his colleagues. Uh, very important study. Um, and to kind of get a picture of how much fecal matter this is, the total fecal matter uh, produced in 2014 would fill over 1.6 million Olympic-sized swimming pools, or to put it another way, bury the entire surface area of Los Angeles and New York, Los Angeles, California, and New York City under six feet of feces. So, and we produce increasing amounts each year. So that's a lot of fecal matter. Um, and uh, human fecal matter is a major issue. Uh, now here in the US, uh, we benefit from having uh, good sanitation systems, but there's uh, over 670 million people who don't have access to adequate sanitation. And so they're defecating outdoors. It's called open defecation. Uh, and these are many of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia where they don't have access to basic sanitation. Animal fecal matter, or also called manure, uh, constitutes about 80% of the 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter that is produced. Uh, and um, there's really not much being done. There, you know, these um, sanitation systems that we have are designed for human fecal matter, not animal fecal matter. Uh, and one study looking at 34 countries found that 30 out of 34 did have national policies, but, um, but it's one thing to have policies, it's another to actually enforce them. Uh, and many countries really don't have enforcement in adequate uh, global, uh, adequate uh, national uh, manure management. So um, in addition to that, we've got these large concentrated animal feeding operations uh, here in the West, where you can have hundreds, thousands, millions of animals in close confined quarters. And of course, they're all defecating. Um, and unfortunately, this uh, US GAO, US Government Accountability Office report back in 2008, 
that's the most recent one I could find, says that no federal agency cons collects consistent, reliable data on these concentrated animal feed operations. And some of these large operations produce more than 1.6 million tons of manure a year. Uh, and they can generate more raw waste than the populations of some US cities produce annually. So that's a huge issue that we rarely discuss. Now there's a lot of uh, pathogens, uh, dangerous microbes in human feces, and I'm not gonna list them all or go over them in detail, but in one gram of feces, there's over 10 million viruses, 1 million bacteria, a thousand parasite cysts and a hundred parasitic eggs. So that's a lot of microbes uh, in fecal matter that can uh, contaminate uh, food or water uh, and potentially get people sick. Similarly, there's lots of pathogens in animal fecal matter. And unfortunately, there are very few studies that actually examine the pathogens in animal fecal matter, but the pathogens that uh, were found in this study, which was a systematic review, found that uh, many of the microbes are some of the most common, such as Salmonella and Shigella and Campylobacter, some of the most common in E. coli, uh, some of the most common um, microbes that cause foodborne uh, and waterborne illnesses. Now in 2015, the World Health Organization released a report estimating the global burden of foodborne illnesses and these illnesses are usually caused by fecal contamination. They found that about one in 10 people are sickened by food each year, and about 600 million people who get sick, around 420,000 die. Children under the age of five make up 40% of the cases, and most of the cases are due to diarrheal disease agents, a lot of the pathogens that we saw in animal fecal matter as well as human fecal matter too. So fecal matter uh, is a, a huge issue when it comes to foodborne, and I'm not gonna have time to talk about waterborne illnesses. Okay, so let's now jump to our second One Health analysis, and I'm going to talk about plants, uh, cereal crops, looking at microbial and population level, international and global. So, the world has over 50,000 edible plants, but just three of them, rice, maize, or also known as corn, and wheat, provide 60% of the world's food energy intake. Now, what do you need for a healthy plant? Well, you need these obvious things like carbon dioxide, water, and soil, but plants also require nutrients, and that includes nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Now, uh, in 1944, there was concern about, uh, with the rising uh, human population, there was concern that we weren't going to be able to feed everybody. Uh, and so um, the Green Revolution was developed. Uh, this is a picture of Dr. Norman Borlaug, who was a plant pathologist, and he developed new wheat varieties that were resistant to disease and adapted to growing um, in different conditions with very high yields. Um, and his efforts became known as the Green Revolution, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work to avert wide, widespread hunger uh, throughout the developing world. His efforts were so successful, you can see that cereal production and yield just took off from 1961, just really, over 200% increase as the population increased. But interestingly, the amount of land needed for all of this increase stayed about the same. It was really quite amazing. And there was a lot of land sparing that uh, was, a, was done. The land was consistently uh, around uh, over 500 million hectares to produce all of this cereal to feed the growing world population. And uh, the cereal yield in 2018, uh, you can see some countries have much higher yield than others. 
uh, but still, nevertheless, the um, the production uh, to feed billions of people is really truly remarkable. Unfortunately, with the good comes the bad, and there were, of course, problems with the Green Revolution, and that included intensive farming practices, soil erosion, water shortages, micronutrient deficiencies, a dependency on chemicals, and vulnerability to pests. And um, of course, since these were genetically modified crops, uh, it led to some political opposition, but that's another whole subject that I won't have a chance to get into tonight. Um, but what's important to discuss, getting back to the issue of all the fecal matter that we're producing, um, the question is how much manure versus synthetic fertilizer is being used in agriculture. Now in 1961, there was about 18, a little over 18 billion kilograms of fecal matter. And fecal matter provides important nutrients for plants. Uh, it includes nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, this is focusing just on nitrogen. By 2019, uh, 20, over, a little over 27 billion kilograms of manure was used. Um, but when you look at synthetic fertilizer, um, in 1961, not much was used, far less than manure, but by 2019, 100, over almost 109 billion kilograms of synthetic fertilizer, high nitrogen is being used. So by 2019, four times more synthetic fertilizer is being used than manure. Now, why might this be a problem? Well, there's a, a variety of comparisons between manure and fertilizer. First of all, we have a lot of manure uh, that it would be nice if it was being used. Components of manure include organic matter, uh, like the benefits, like some beneficial microbes, uh, fiber and solids that, um, that help with soil health. So if it's not being used, then what's being done with it? What's being done with all of this manure uh, that uh, runs the risk of causing uh, foodborne and waterborne illness, contaminating the soils uh, and ecosystems? And that brings me then to the third part of the One Health analysis, looking at environments and ecosystems. So, um, as I had mentioned in the beginning of the talk, climate change threatens agriculture, and unfortunately, agriculture worsens climate change. Now, to truly understand the term climate change, we need to look at the geologic timeline of the temperature of the planet. And this is the geologic timeline since the beginning of complex life on the planet since the Cambrian explosion. And yes, the planet was very hot back here, uh, but humanity didn't exist, nor did agriculture. And the planet cooled over time. Uh, and uh, this was when the uh, early hominids appeared in the Pliocene. Um, you get to the Pleistocene where you had the ice age and agriculture certainly didn't exist. Humans lived here. Um, but there was no agriculture for the simple reason much of the planet was covered with thick ice. But now here's the key part. Around 10,000 years ago, the planet started warming. It's not clear exactly why, but the, cl the climate began to warm during this period now called the Holocene. We live in the Holocene era. And when I saw this graph, I suddenly understood climate change because for the past 10,000 years, for this entire duration of uh, civilization has existed for 10,000 years. And the reason why it's existed for 10,000 years is because the climate has allowed it. We've been on this Holocene baseline that has allowed us to have agriculture. It's a relatively mild, predictable climate where you knew when to uh, plant the seeds and when to harvest, um, and it allowed us to have agriculture and food security. Now, there were a few little deviations 
Uh, there was the little ice age that was about one or two degrees below the uh, Holocene baseline. And the um, artists who lived at that time documented for us what happened. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who are interested in learning more about the ge geologic perspective of climate change, I highly recommend this book, Timefulness, How Thinking Like a Geologist Can Help Save the World. It's a beautifully written book. But talking about the Little Ice Age here, the artists um, documented what the Little Ice Age looked like, and it lasted from about 1300 to 1850. Now, this is just a little blip below the Holocene baseline, and you had frost, uh, frost fairs on the Thames uh, for a couple hundred years. You had this frozen wasteland in, in Flanders. You had ice skating in Rotterdam. But what's most important is that the Little Ice Age was noted for crop failures, bread riots, famine, and wars. It profoundly impacted agriculture with bad weather uh, and uh, storms that destroyed the crops and people starved and you had widespread famine. It wasn't a pretty picture. Now, um, so the threat to agriculture and to civilization then is profound when you get off that Holocene baseline. Uh, and right now we're about one degree above that Holocene baseline and we're seeing the effects now uh, with uh, these storms uh, and uh, huge amounts of flooding because there's now more water and energy in the system. Now in 2010, the World Bank did some modeling and they estimated that agricultural yields in 2050 or about 30 years from now due to climate change effects assuming that we uh, maintain current agricultural practices and crop varieties, you'll see that much of the world is going to become too hot and too dry to grow food, which is going to have a huge impact on food security and on civilization. So uh, climate change is not only going to increase uh, the problems with the weather, but it's going to profoundly impact then agriculture. So that is why it is the existential threat that it is. Now, even now in 2020, uh, the world, there's, um, according to the world hunger map, there's a lot of countries where there's uh, a lot of hunger and uh, without food security. So we're starting out in not great shape uh, in terms of ensuring that everybody has enough to eat. So uh, manure and most importantly, synthetic high nitrogen fertilizers emit major greenhouse gases. They are major sources of methane and nitrous oxide. So carbon dioxide does trap greenhouse, uh, does trap heat. Methane is about 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide at trapping heat and nitrous oxide is 265 times more potent than carbon dioxide at trapping heat. So according to the, um, the US uh, EPA in 2017, the US methane emissions about 9% come from manure management and 27%, a huge amount from enteric fermentation from, cattles, from cattle, also known as cow burping. And that's a, another whole subject that I'm not going to have time to get into. Uh, more concern, as concerningly, is uh, the nitrous oxide emissions, which are very potent greenhouse gases. Again, manure management uh, contributes to that. And hugely, agricultural soil management, 74% of our nitrous oxide emissions come from that. So, these are huge contributions to greenhouse gases, and that's coming from agriculture. So right now, our current policies put us about 2.7 or 3 degrees above that Holocene baseline. Not great, but it's not as catastrophic as if we would get 4.1 to 4.8 degrees above the baseline if we had no climate policies. 
But ideally, we want to stay as close to that Holocene baseline as possible to ensure that we have a climate that allows for agriculture. Uh, and that would require much more stringent pledges and targets uh, if we want to get no higher than two degrees, which isn't great, but um, right now we've already risen by one degree. So we want to be down here, but currently our trajectory is up here and that really is not good enough. We need to do much better. So um, now let me just quickly talk about ecosystems because I was talking about the environment, the global resistome. Now, when we talk about antimicrobial resistance, we're usually focusing just on humans or just on animals, but it turns out antimicrobial resistance is in the environment and it's ancient and it's everywhere. Uh, for, for most of, um, most of the um, research on this was hobbled by the fact that we couldn't really grow the soil microbes in the laboratory. So we don't really know what goes on under the soil. And for a long time, it was thought that bacteria use these chemicals, these antibiotics as a form of chemical warfare against each other. But that's not what it turns out to be. It turns out that they actually use minute amounts of antibiotics as a form of communication with each other. Uh, and with our blasting the, uh, the global ecosystem with all of our manure and our antibiotics in agriculture and in humans, we're, we're changing all of this microbial ecosystems and so they are increasing their expression of these genes, which are already out there. They're naturally occurring. And they're very nicely sharing these resistance genes with each other to protect each other from our onslaught against them. So in other words, we're working against nature and we're losing. It's never good to work against nature um, and uh, working for it is another whole subject that I'm not gonna have a chance to get to uh, maybe talk a bit about in the uh, Q&A if there's time. So then how are humans adversely impacting the global resistome? Well, through poor sanitation, indiscriminate antibiotic use, untreated human and animal waste, four trillion or at least 80% the animal waste isn't being treated, uh, some human waste is, land and water contamination from all this fecal matter. And that helps to contribute to the spread of resistant microbes and genes by wildlife, particularly birds. Now, the other question is how much of an impact does all of this fecal waste have on antibiotic use? Because as it leaches into the soils and into the water and on our crops, um, it contaminates uh, the food and the water and it gets people sick. Um, so this was a very interesting thing. There's, these are two completely different studies. One is the uh, global recoverable fecal mass that I had described earlier. And this was a study looking at global antibiotic consumption from 2010, 20, 2000 to 2010. And interestingly enough, in, in this uh, analysis of sales data of antibiotics, two countries, New Zealand and Australia, had some of the highest antibiotic use per person in the world. And I was wondering, well, why would Australia and New Zealand, they're both fairly affluent countries, why would they use so much antibiotic, uh, antibiotics per person? Well, if you look at the animal to human fecal ratios, there's a lot more animals than humans in Australia and New Zealand. They've got a lot of sheep. And uh, they have among the highest ratios of animal to human fe feces in the world. And so maybe that might explain why they have such a high use of um, antibiotics, but I don't know, is there a relationship? And it would be very nice to see if studies could be done to look to see if um, high uh, and uh, animal to human fecal ratios in the environment it impacts antibiotic use. So that's just a, uh, a thought to throw out at all of you. 
Um, but there are there is evidence that a manure, animal manure, is a potential hotspot for antimicrobial resistance, and they spread through the bacteria, share it amongst themselves. And this was a study that was done in Veterinary Sciences, published last year. So manure uh, contaminates environments, ecosystems, and can serve potentially as a hotspot for antimicrobial resistance. It's a very serious concern. So let's, let me turn now to the fourth and final One Health analysis, looking at humans' populations, focusing on the political, social, and economic factors now. Um, food security, as I said, agriculture and food security is the foundation of civilization. Food security means no hungry people and is built on the pillars of availability, access, and use. And food security is so important that it's listed as number two of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as zero hunger. There are political implications when food security breaks down, as we saw during the mini ice age, the little ice age, when uh, crop failures led to famine. Here in more recent periods, um, there were spiking food prices, food price index that spikes. You start seeing people uh, begin to riot when food prices begin to uh, get too high. Uh, and civilization breaks down, civil society breaks down. So there are very important political implications when we don't have uh, agriculture and food security to ensure that people are fed. Now looking at meat consumption, because of course all of these food animals are being raised to provide meat and other proteins, animal proteins for human consumption, and here in the US, we are one of the top consumers of meat, uh, along with uh, other wealthy developed countries. Um, there are pros and cons to eating meat. It provides important micronutrients such as vitamin B12 and iron. And some have argued that we evolved into modern humans because we hunted, cooked, and ate meat. And eating meat's an integral part of many cultures and religions. There are cons, however. Meat's not essential if we supplement our diet, which we can do. It increases zoonotic spillover events, um, which uh, we are undergoing a, a zoonotic pandemic right now. That's another whole talk that I won't get into tonight. Raising millions of domesticated or billions domesticated animals, hunting wild animals, contaminates environments and ecosystems and reduces biodiversity. So there are certainly costs to our practices of um, widespread meat consumption. But nevertheless, global meat production is skyrocketing to meet uh, global, uh, global demand. And eating meat is the norm almost everywhere. The one exception is India. They have the highest fraction of vegetarians in the world, largely because many of them are Hindu and Hinduism requires veg uh, being vegetarian. However, even in India, um, there is an increasing trend of, of drinking milk uh, and consuming other animal products. So, the solution of everybody becoming vegetarian, I think, is unrealistic. And so we have to figure out solutions given the conditions that we have. Um, there are, however, uh, changing national dietary preferences are pos is possible, but it requires significant cultural and societal change. There are more Americans cutting back on meat consumption. Um, and many of them are cutting back largely for health concerns, uh, but also for environmental concerns as well. Um, food safety, animal welfare are other reasons. So a brief recap now on our One Health analysis, looking at all of these factors. Uh, what are the findings? Well, humans and domesticated animal populations are growing 
and producing increasing amounts of fecal matter each year. Animals produce 80% of it, uh, but it's generally, this is generally ignored. Not quite clear what's being done with it if it's not being used for fertilizer, if the preference is for synthetic high nitrogen fertilizer, which is contributing to um, nitrous oxide emissions. Um, but you know, manure is producing these emissions as well. So this is a very serious uh, concern in terms of contributing to climate change that we need to uh, start the discussion on. Human and animal fecal matter contain many pathogens, but sanitation systems are designed to process human waste, not animal waste. And there's little oversight of manure management in many middle to low income countries and little oversight of concentrated animal feed operation manure management in the US. So it's not just middle and low income countries, it's in this country as well. Nevertheless, plants, to have healthy plants, which we absolutely must have if, uh, because our lives and the lives of all our feed animals depend on plants, um, they need nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Many of these, particularly nitrogen, are contained in manure, but synthetic fertilizer use predominates. So as I mentioned, manure and agricultural soil management are emitting methane and nitrous oxide, which are potent greenhouse gases. And manure risks contaminating the global resistome, which is worsening antimicrobial resistance and includes potentially increasing antibiotic use. So all of these findings then impact food safety and the practice of medicine, as well as food security and the continuation of agriculture. So what can be done then? What, what can we do? Well, the um, UN General Assembly had a meeting back in September 2016, and they agreed that antimicrobial resistance required global action, and they recognized a One Health approach was important. Um, and the World Health Organization developed a uh, antimicrobial resistance global action plan to serve as a model for all nations to develop their national action plans. Um, unfortunately, uh, they leave out the manure management and ecosystem impact. So there's no mention. They do recognize that the importance of sanitation, hygiene, and infection prevention measures are needed, but there's no recognition of fecal matter, uh, and in particular, no mention of manure management um, and its potential impact on antimicrobial resistance. So I think that's a, a huge oversight that needs to be addressed. The Paris Climate Agreement had many key points that to get countries to agree to work together to try to keep that uh, emissions to try to keep the temperature of the planet as close to that Holocene baseline as possible. But unfortunately, there's no mention of curtailing agriculture's greenhouse gas emissions, which is a major oversight because these are among the most potent greenhouse gases that are being emitted. Um, there are strategies to reduce methane and nitrous oxide, efforts in manure management to change the way it's stored uh, using methane digesters to collect the methane that's being released and converted into renewable energy. And then in terms of agricultural soil management, which emits a lot of nitrous oxide, they recommend using low nitrogen fertilizer, uh, as well as perhaps nitrification inhibitors using cover crops and no-till farming. But again, there's really no discussion about the use of manure. There's only been one political entity that has uh, passed any kind of legislation dealing with agriculture's contribution to greenhouse gases, and that's the state of California. Their bill um, addressed sh short-lived climate pollutant reduction strategies, uh, and they allocated 12 million to support dairy methane reduction projects, such as a dairy digester pro uh, research and development program. And, uh, Richard Ricardo Lara, who's currently the California Insurance Commissioner, um, he was a representative. Uh, he was instrumental in helping to pass this bill. So we need to see many more states and many countries following suit. 
So we must restore our beautiful planet and One Health recognizes the interconnectedness of all of life. This framework helps us to see the connections. And you might ask, well, what can you do? Well, certainly learning about One Health and seeing the connections, helping to spread the word, cultivating interdisciplinary colleagues to work together uh, and to organize and be change agents uh, to uh, ensure that we um, push to have a uh, healthy and sustainable future. And as Reg had mentioned earlier, um, my Coursera course, Bats, Ducks, and Pandemics, an Introduction to One Health Policy, it's free and it's online. Uh, and uh, I encourage all of you to, um, to sign up and, and take it. And uh, I would be thrilled if you all uh, checked it out. Uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues in the One Health Initiative. We were co-founded in 2006. Our website we established in 2008, and this is our team. And uh, I would like to thank you all for your time and attention and hope that we have some time for questions. Uh, and with that, I think I will stop my, my slide share. Uh, and, uh, we do have some questions, so uh, if you'd like, I'll read the questions to you. And just remind everybody in the Q&A, uh, please do uh, put your questions in there, and hopefully we'll be able to get to them. At the moment, we have a couple, and the first one is from Zach. Uh, he says, hi, Dr. Ka. Do you think that increasing the manure level use in fertilizer, use more manure and less synthetic fertilizer, could eventually cause concern in the plants that are grown from it? That's a great question. Um, I am not an expert in um, plant crop agriculture, uh, but uh, I mean, one of the reasons why synthetic fertilizers are being used is because they are very effective in providing high levels of nitrogen to plants. Um, and that enabled us to have such high uh, crop yields uh, using the same amount of land, basically. So, um, so that's a challenge. We've got all this manure, and what happens if we switch to it? Would the yields go down? I'm not sure. I think uh, I think it would be worthy to do perhaps a pilot study, looking to see if uh, agriculture would be more sustainable using manure, no-till. Uh, uh, you know, no-till agriculture and cover crops as, as a strategy for greater sustainability. And our next question is from Michelle. Are there any examples of decently managed livestock fecal practices that sustainability avoid contaminating their local environment? That's a great question. Um, I haven't exactly looked into that. There is a concern, however, that um, with, uh, with hurricanes, even the best, and I didn't show the slide, uh, but uh, during this one hurricane, um, it completely flooded the manure lagoon that was being secured and then spreading manure all around. This was in North Carolina. This was a, a pig manure, swine manure lagoon that spread fecal, uh, fecal uh, matter all around the state, or at least in the region around the, um, the, the, the pig farm. Uh, we don't know what the results of that were because I hadn't found any um, uh, newspaper articles or any kind of um, results from, from that event. So uh, that's a, it's, it's an important issue and one that needs further study. So thank you for that question. Yeah, and there were interesting impacts from spills like that, that ultimately though that matter reaches the ocean and then we see- That's right. Repercussions in the ocean as well. That's right, that's right. So our next question is from Claire. So we really don't know what all these farmers, livestock managers do with all the, their animal species. It's not treated, managed. That's shocking. Well, Not sure that's very, a question, but <laughs> yeah. Well, there's there's very little federal oversight 
uh, as that uh, GAO report indicated. So uh, without oversight, it's hard to know what the farms are doing. Now, some are, uh, I think, using some of these digesters to capture uh, the methane, but um, you know, I don't see any data for it. So the, the answer is we don't know. We don't know what's being done with all of this manure. And now, you know, and of course this is a global issue. Um, we don't know what's going on with the manure. So Robert uh, says, do you think the reason that uh, why some people don't believe in climate change is because they don't know the difference between climate and weather? Yeah, I think that is certainly uh, perhaps a part of it. I, I think that um, scientists have done, they could have done a much better job explaining climate change because for a long time, change from, you know, I didn't know what it meant, change from what? I mean, what does that even mean? Uh, and it wasn't until my oldest son, who's actually a geology graduate student, introduced me to this geologic timeline. And if he hadn't done that, I still wouldn't really understand <laughs> what climate change means. But when he showed me this geologic timeline, I looked at it and my heart stopped because I suddenly understood what it meant. And, you know, and I saw, because I was focused on agriculture and I saw the timeline for in the entire duration of 10,000 years of agriculture, the timeline's been on this baseline and, and, you know, and suddenly we're going off it. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I just can't tell you what an impact that had for me. I'm a very visual person. And I think if they use that or something like that as a visual to describe what's at stake here, um, perhaps people would understand more of what climate change really means. It means change from the Holocene baseline that has allowed agriculture and civilization to exist. Um, it, it's much more profound than simply worse storms and flooding and drought and all of that. It means our food supply is in jeopardy and we should all be up in arms about that. And we're already seeing in some parts of the world where they're their food supply is drying up, you know, particularly in the equatorial regions uh, and in Africa. So um, it's, it's a, you know, we've got a, was it a five alarm fire going and we're just putting along? Um, you know, all of us need to be a part of the solution and, uh, and galvanize everybody that we need to address this as soon as possible. I think another visual, uh... Thing that really helps a great deal in understanding too between natural forcings and uh, anthropogenic kinds of changes uh, is really useful. Uh, so you, there's a great graphic and I don't remember who it came from, but it demonstrates what natural forcings would be doing at this point in our geologic history. Right. But when we look at that and then we look at also what uh, anthropogenic anthropogenic changes are taking place, what we're doing. And then we looked at observed temperatures, they match very, very well. So it's a, it's a very convincing graph of the, yes, we are the cause of yeah. much of this. Yeah. 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 So uh, anonymous, we have, hi there. How do you think the COVID-19 pandemic affected our understanding of food security? I know of certain products that became hard to find or became more expensive. Any thoughts? Um, I don't really see, at least sitting here from my perspective, um, I don't really see an impact on food security from the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, certainly it's impacted agriculture uh, and it's uh, impacted many of the agricultural workers, but we haven't really felt any severe shortages that I'm aware of. Now, maybe there are shortages in other places, but I haven't, and I follow the media closely and I haven't, I mean, aside from the toilet paper shortage that we had, you know, during the early periods of the pandemic and who knew that civilization could collapse because of a shortage of toilet paper, but people were up in arms and hoarding. Um, and this was toilet paper. 
so, uh, you know, early on, it certainly had an impact with the supply chain because that got disrupted, but um, things seem to have uh, equilibrated or normalized since then. Uh, and Claire again has, uh, do you have any examples of some of the fecal processors that produce renewable energy? I don't have specific examples, but uh, it's certainly online. Uh, if you Google um, methane digesters, um, that, uh, that will bring up a lot of information. Um, if you look, if you Google manure uh, sanitation systems, for example, or manure processing, uh, not much comes up. And there were a couple of things that came in in chat. I'm going to go back over to those for a minute here before we go back over to the uh, Q&A. But uh, Casey said, in PA, we have strict manure and nutrient management policies. But like Dr. Khan said, we need more enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Melissa said, your slides images were so impactful. Will your slides be available? Well, Melissa, we are uh, recording this, this presentation. So uh, ultimately at uh, delval.edu forward slash one health, uh, you will be able to see a recording of this presentation if that helps. Uh, I right. should also mention that um, I based my talk off uh, a, um, an article that I wrote and published this past December. So I will include the link to it in the chat. Great. So uh, that's, that's available now uh, in the chat box, the, the link to the article. Perfect, thank you. So Phoebe asks, uh, is human sewage being used as fertilizer? Has it been treated and if so, by what? There are parts of the world that do use human sewage as fertilizer. It's called night soil. Um, whether or not it's being treated, I don't know. These are often in developing, poor developing countries such as India. Um, not clear if they're, if they're being treated or not. Um, Michelle, do you think we are quickly heading for overshoot? What does she mean by overshoot? I am not sure. Michelle, would you uh, maybe further down, uh, hopefully we'll come back to you and make sure we understand what it is that you mean. Uh, so Abigail, besides agriculture, what are other things that are directly causing climate change? Well, uh, certainly the um, burning of fossil fuels. Now, it's interesting that many of these fossil fuels are degraded plants. Uh, you know, plants are great and trees, they absorb carbon dioxide and with time uh, they get broken down by microbes uh, into um, coal. I mean, the, you know, these products are uh, ancient forests or what have you. Uh, and so they, they captured CO2. Uh, and by us burning it, we're just releasing it back into the atmosphere. So we're, we're releasing all of the CO2 that had been captured eons before. Um, so that, in addition to all the other things that we're doing, um, is contributing to all the greenhouse gases. Transportation, there's, you know, uh, energy um, use, these all contribute to uh, fossil fuel emissions. Uh, anonymous, does this also include data from aquaculture as well, or is it only considering typical forms of agriculture? Yeah, I'm not, I didn't include regular agri uh, aquaculture in, in this talk, okay. but certainly aquaculture uses a lot of antibiotics because uh, fish did not evolve to live in tightly packed environments, tightly packed pens. And so they are existing in all of their w collected wastes and they get sick. So they use antibiotics to treat them. So that's a serious problem. They also change the ecosystems where those are located too, because exactly. all of that waste is feeding a whole different system than normal. Yeah. Uh, also uh, from an anonymous attendee, with some crops being able to generate their own nitrogen legumes, 
Do you foresee a potential shift into more legume production over grain production? And if so, what can be done with extra manure used for fertilizer? Well, uh, you could develop crops that could fix their own ni nitrogen, but it would probably be called a genetically modified organism. Uh, and in fact, there is a uh, effort being done right now. Dr. Joanne Chory, C-H-O-R-Y, is doing fascinating work developing a super chickpea plant that um, uh, has um, extra long roots with this cork-like material to capture CO2 uh, that could um, you know, help to counteract uh, climate change. It's called the Harnessing Plants um, Initiative. And uh, let me just see if I can look that up. Um, that is a very interesting um, project, but again, it depends on if the public's going to accept eating foods from, and this is chickpeas, so I, I um, call it can hummus save civilization, uh, super chickpea plants, but um, uh, again, it depends. I mean, I think genetically modified organisms can play a very important role for helping to ensure food security in an era of a warming climate. Um, but the question is, are people going to accept it? What can be done with the extra manure used for fertilizer? That's a great question. Uh, we need to figure out what to do with all of this manure. Uh, Michelle added, uh, and I should have caught this, Michelle, I'm sorry. Overshoot, what she's referring to is uh, human population, or I guess the human population and our livestock, uh, exceeding the carrying capacity of the, of the globe. Um, is that a possibility? Um, thoughts well, there, on that? Yeah, there, there are plenty of people who say that we've already far overshot the carrying capacity of this planet, but there are plenty who disagree with that. So um, it depends on who you ask. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, if we develop robust genetically modified organisms, we, uh, and if people eat far less meat, uh, particularly in the high meat consumption countries like the U.S., um, we could certainly help to would help to feed the billions of people, eight billion and growing. Um, but it requires global cooperation and a willingness to change your diet, which is, by the way, a healthier diet. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with the blue zones, but. Um, this journalist, Dan Butner, was um, hired by the National Geographic Society to travel the world looking for the world's longest lived people. And he found uh, these, what are called blue zones, the ones in Italy, ones in Greece, ones in Loma Linda, California, ones in Japan, ones in Costa Rica. Uh, and these regions, uh, people live, uh, there are, is a concentration of people who live to over 100 years old. And you look at their diet, um, only one in Loma Linda are they vegetarian, but the others, they eat only four to five percent of their diet is meat. The rest is fruits and vegetables primarily. Um, so uh, that's one could argue the healthiest diet because it's primarily fruits and vegetables with a little bit of meat for protein. The other thing I'll point out, and I didn't have time to get into, is that um, you know we have uh, microbes that are on us and in us, and uh, our gut microbiome turns out is as important for our health and well-being as any of our organs. And our gut microbes like a high-fiber diet; they like fruits and vegetables. Uh, and when they're happy and healthy, they're producing a lot of mucus, which protects the lining of our gut and, um, and we are, are healthy. When they're unhappy and they get a lot of refined sugar and a lot of highly processed foods, when they're unhappy, they don't produce the mucus and that can lead to inflammation and to uh, disease. So our microbes, if we listen to them, tell us what they want. The question is, you know, are we gonna feed it to them? So when you eat, 
you're not just feeding your body, you're feeding your gut microbes. And uh, it's in your best interest to keep them happy. <laughs> We've got one last question here. We're actually past our time and I want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Khan. Sure. Abigail asks, if you could say one sentence to change somebody's mind that doesn't believe in climate change, what would it be? Well, uh, climate change like the COVID-19, like SARS-CoV-2, doesn't really care if you believe in it or not. It's, hap it's happening. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can believe in it. You cannot believe in it. That's the thing about, you know, these scientific issues that they're existing uh, and climate change is here. So uh, if you want a sustainable future, if you want a sustainable future for your kids, um, you know, we all need to play our part in, uh, in helping to make that happen. Great. Uh, I see in the chat that some folks said that they did not see the link. Uh, if you did not see the link, I did. And uh, I have a link to that particular article and I will make sure that it goes to our library. And Claire reminds us that uh, besides uh, delval.edu forward slash One Health, uh, that all of our presentations all show up at library.delvalet.edu forward slash One Health. Uh, and also she has an enormous amount of reference materials that she puts in association with these presentations. And I will make sure that this article gets over to that list as well. So it will be something that you can reach to. Uh, with that, uh, I think it will be time for us to close. We've had an enormous amount of conversation and questions. Thank you all for attending and for uh, sticking with us here and having so many uh, questions and comments and suggestions. And Dr. Khan, we look forward to your new book you're working on. And Thank you. Let's say we'll have you back in a couple of years to talk about that. Sounds great. <laughs> well, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak. It's been a pleasure. Well, it's been a pleasure for us too. For all of you, uh, good night. And uh, let's hope that our weather stays somewhat calm for a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night.